Hey everybody, Kit Merker here from Noble9, and today I'm with Dan Fernandez. He's the VP of Developer Services at Salesforce. Say hi, Dan. Hi, pleasure to be here. Thanks, Kit. Well, thanks for joining me. Well, we were talking off camera a little bit about um, you know developers and building developer tools, and I, I wanted to hear you know your philosophy a little bit. I think it'd be interesting. You've been working with developer um, enabling developers for a long time, and developers are really tough to you know, to trick into buying things. How do you kind of approach, uh, approach that? Uh, I have a lot of experience kind of on that other side of not getting them to, I'll kind of uh, tell you that story. But I think the biggest area is just really focusing on that you're solving their problem, right? And you're solving a problem in a way that they want, right? So uh, if you're building a solution that, hey, wow, this is great, but it doesn't integrate with any of the other stuff we have, that's not going to work. If the licensing and pricing model is terrible, that's not going to work. If the way you start the product is the first thing you need to do is go talk to a salesperson. Like, no, I want a tire kick. I really want to like give this thing, you know, spend two hours building my thing. And if I fail at that, it's probably an indication that I'm never going to use that software again. Um, uh, I think the other areas uh, um, that developers tend to look for is, does it support the things that I want, right? So what's the programming language? What's the framework? You know, our company is set on this version of, of Node, so we have to support this. Like there's a number of things that you would call kind of checkbox in, in hey, I'm doing a Pepsi challenge, five different products or services. And I just need to have kind of the check boxes before I can decide whether to do that. So some of those are in, you know, things like regulating compliance industries, like a, a dev just going to be like, okay, we can't use this because it's not, I don't know, GDPR compliant, HIPAA compliant, SOX compliance, um, those sort of thing. I think the other area that's kind of, uh, if you really like kind of break it down, that's like the minds, right? And there's this great theory on kind of hearts and minds. So great, I did kind of the logical reason, the Spock reasons for why I want the software. The other part is the hearts, which is, man, that software is so much easier. Oh, it already knew what my intent was. I didn't have to do this thing. It got rid of like the most annoying parts of building software. Like maybe it's automating boilerplate things, or maybe it's so dramatically faster that, that you kind of have this like uh, emotional reaction, like a deployment that always takes like 10 minutes just to F5 your local machine, you now click save and you see instant feedback. You're like, this is, this is amazing. I, I like shut up and take my money. You're talking a little bit about the developer experience, which I think is really interesting. And it's almost like the developer experience and the traditional user experience are almost like the opposite, right? The developer wants, <laughs> <laughs> wants command line, they want everything in text that, and, and it's very confusing to people who are traditional UX designers. How do you think about DX versus UX? Yeah, I think it's a good point. One thing to keep in mind though is, uh, you know, there's kind of this great reality check where everybody says they want CLI and automation. That's not necessarily true. In fact, from a usage perspective, what they do is they want CLI uh, for their automation, like their CI builds, like, hey, we're trying to be an agile organization. We need this to just work. It needs to be reliable, repeatable. There should be no human involved in doing these particular tasks. But a number of times where they kick things around, they'd much rather prefer kind of the portal view. So, so when you look, if you ask somebody, what is the actual traffic? You know, this would be a great test. Uh, like if a human interacts with things, are, is the human using the CLI or say the AWS CLI versus uh, the portal, I think you'd actually find the tilt for portal would be more popular. Now, what if you looked at like, hey, what about the automation scenarios? Oh yeah, it's gonna be CLI. And even those things are shifting. So a classic thing that we've seen happen, um, I mean, uh, with you know the rise of Kubernetes and Docker is kind of CLIs for everything. There's also been a shift in, there's a number of folks that are building um, uh, uh, control plane libraries so in the language that you want. So let's just uh, use kind of uh, uh, as one example, Pulumi does that, which is you give me anything with Terraform and now you can use whatever programming language you want. So rather like, you know, they should have the just say no to YAML <laughs> as kind of the developer experience. And there's, a, you know, kind of depending on where you are, if folks came from some other programming language or maybe from JSON, they're like, oh, or uh, they were like, oh, thank God for YAML. Other folks are like, no, I like writing in my programming language of choice. I like having things like variables. I like having a debug button instead of it, like getting this obtuse error message or something where you could iterate 
through like my actual script where I can use Python, Java, you know, whatever the programming language of their choice is. So AWS has this great uh, CD, uh, uh, their CDK, their cloud SDK, use the language if you want to kind of build infrastructure. So the point is like, what do developers want? They want to have their cake and eat it too, right? Which is like, give me something super easy on a portal, but it really needs to be uh, easy for a CLI automation. And to be honest, I'd love it in my programming language of choice. So when you, you brought up reliability in that, uh, in that uh, very uh, comprehensive rant there, which I love, <laughs> but the reliability question, uh, how, do you, how important would you say, or what, what are the um, factors for reliability with developer tools and cloud tools today? What, what's the mindset around reliability? Yeah, so I think there's probably a couple things, which is what do you think of reliability? There's like, I'm using a developer tool and I want it to be reliable. Or the other thing is how do I build reliability into the product? So uh, uh, on the first one, there's, I think a number of things that you want to do. And this goes back to even just kind of a human case that you look at classic one is you're typing. If you've ever used Microsoft word or a developer tool, if you ever see latency as you're typing words, it's kind of just painful. Like imagine if there's, uh, and if you think about what something like the C++ compiler has to do, it literally has to build in real time all of the things that are going on. And there's some great uh, videos from like, you know, compiler geeks on how they do that efficiently. So that's kind of the reliability where like, all of, you can't just have this performance where it's like, yes, it's great. And then, you know what, I'm gonna wait three seconds in the middle of a word, but, but because it's averaged out, then if you were to look at you know, some statistic, you'd see everything's great. Everybody's moving to kind of this microservices world and how do you kind of build both reliability and resilience into, uh, into those systems? So uh, like I think kind of the crawl, walk, run, I think some of the problems sometimes we have is even on testing, hey, I know I'm getting a 200 uh, okay message back and, and that service is up, but that service is returning null customers. Oops. <laughs> well, uh, that's awkward. But like, again, if you're looking at some dashboard, you're like, all of our services are up. I don't know what you're talking about. Right. I think the reliability also gets that much more complex when you add more systems and when things are moving across, that's where you get things like distributed tracing, which is how do I have a correlation ID that says, you know, I had a customer ID here. I had a customer ID here. I had a customer ID here and I somehow lost it. Right and that decision tree, um, but you need to understand not only just kind of uh, for performance, like, hey, what are, what's the, the end speed of all these items, but also like where, where, where are the actual issues happening, right? And how do you connect that both with logging and metric and tracing and do that in kind of a, an efficient way? And I think that's where we're going. And I think the other area is for developers, if you ask them like, hey, I'd much rather, it's, it's this completely different view than, than I would say ops, which is I never wanna care about the machine. Like my, should, my focus and the best company that's kind of talking about this um, uh, is doing some flighting tools where they say, don't worry, like we're worried too much about building a dev and ops. And that's called kind of the accidental complexity, essential complexity is what we really care about. What is the business logic I'm doing and now we have to worry about like, oh man, I have to learn like how to do Webpack or my Webpack failed on step three of the CI and it's a 25 step CI. Like, no, the only thing you actually care about is that business logic. And I think that's why um, it, 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 if you had to take like a 80,000 foot view, it's like people love that simplicity. That's why I think AWS Lambda and kind of serverless has really taken off, which is, you know, there's an input of your code, <laughs> it's gonna process and there's gonna be some output. So the more you can kind of think about that and uh, uh, bringing, removing complexity, if you can, and then kind of understanding uh, the union of all your systems and all your, all your calls, that's, that's the key there. Well, one of the things that seems thematic throughout both sides of that, right, whether it's the reliability of the tools or using tools to build reliability, is what you measure matters a lot, because you were saying yes. that Right. If you look at averages and you look at the wrong, you know, you're looking at the codes and everything kind of looks green, but it's actually a bad experience. What what do you do to make those like to improve measurement? What how how does that work? Yeah. So I think one of the areas too is like there there should be almost like an entire talk on like what's the right way to build metrics. And sometimes they're just so focused on business or so focused on engineering. And how do you have the continuum of them? 
Um, uh, I will share with you my uh, developer story on kind of like bad metrics. <laughs> and Great. one of them was, uh, uh, we literally called it the Afghan, and it goes back to your point on developers being finicky. So it was called the Afghani banker syndrome. I did a blog about this like 12 years ago. And what happened was we launched uh, the very first free version of Visual Studio called Visual Studio Express. And it was going to be available for free online, but because the marketing folks wanted to capture people's ID to have a, you know, a, a customer journey with them. So they can spam them basically, right? So they can send Registration spam. where, yes. So if you looked at that, like if you looked at the metrics and what the dashboard told us, the number one country was Afghanistan. The number one uh, 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 job industry was bankers. You would say, we need to go after the financial services group in, in Afghanistan. In fact, there were more bankers in Afghanistan than the CIA World Factbook said had connections. So <laughs> it was that bad in terms of just like developers going, I don't care. The most popular uh, US zip code, 90210. 11111 and 12345, which all three are valid zip codes, but it just goes to show what you measure, like make sure that you, uh, uh, the intent and measurement also is kind of aligned both across the business and the engineering. Okay, so I think the other area, so business, like, okay, what are we doing? What are we actually measuring? Like what would success look like um, on, on kind of the business side? What are the business outcomes we're trying to drive? And then I think uh, uh, a lot of times that's things like MAO, uh, uh, monthly active users, or maybe it's, uh, you can almost up-level it a little or kind of categorize it like adoption. Like, hey, are we getting people? Are they giving us credit cards? Are they churning like, you know, in, in some sort of funnel? Those are kind of the typical things there. And a lot of times you want to correlate those things, which is where are they feeling? Is it like something that we're re being really annoying? in the signup process. Does the signup process fail? I'll give you a real story today that I had, ticketmaster.com for, uh, uh, I don't know, probably The Kraken three... I bet, because What's of our that? new our new hockey team here in Seattle, the Kraken, right? Yes, I was pulling up my old reservation for, for uh, the Kraken, and all of a sudden, uh, uh, it asked me to send me an SMS code. That SMS, and it did not allow me to get to my profile picture until I added a verification code. That verification service probably built as a microservice because the entire site was fine, but it did not work, right? So if you were trying to do a funnel and say, hey, did we fail? What are the things that you can actually measure user behavior? And uh, you see a number of folks doing this, which is like shopping carts are abandoned based on performance. If they go, you know, even within one or two seconds and so on. And then I think probably uh, uh, going back to the way the other part is like, hey, are the things working? I think the other one that's kind of ignored, especially on engineering teams, is things like cost to serve, right? Like what are the measurements that we have? And are we willing to pay for, you know, really reliable things. Uh, I'm sure that's, that's, you know, add a couple nines and as you know, uh, the cost goes up quite a bit. The, the whole, I mean, this topic of measurement is huge, but I know that you have another thing you wanted to share with us because you built a very cool, uh, I guess, fun project. And uh, I thought it would be cool to take a minute and demo it if you have it handy. So uh, we are at meetingshot.com. This is open source. So this is always kind of the, the fun thing to do. We can now build our own. This is in the Zoom world, right? So we can build our own fake Zoom. So as you can see here, we added some fake tiles. We got uh, uh, Barack Obama. We got some Brady Bunch. Got some friends. We can, of course, add another one and even add kind of a real live webcam. So we'll see if that works because this is like uh, inception here. So I don't know if uh, you have a webcam if, within a webcam. Yeah. Webcam within a webcam, exactly. So um, let's just add a meeting llama. Isn't that wonderful? So, yeah. uh, uh, and this also lets you export meeting and it's really trying to fight the uh, 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 FOMO, the fear of missing meetings which is like, oh yeah, we had a great call. It was fantastic. Francois was on the call and he was amazing. Anybody that wasn't on the call is a lower human being. So you can of course uh, share this. It is all free and it is all of course just for fun. How did you build it? What's it where's the source code? Um, uh, so it is on GitHub. It's uh, GitHub the Dan Fernandez. Let me show that real quick. Um, uh, this is I assume one. you want you want PRs, right? You need people contributing to this important uh, open source project, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, um, 
So uh, there's kind of our, our fake uh, meeting screenshot. And I mean, the code's pretty basic. Uh, even just some of the simple things we wanted to do was, this goes back to another area, which is save time for yourself, for developers, for kind of self-improvement to build fun, cool projects. Because what we always do, especially either as kind of product managers or the higher up you go for leads, you lose, like if you did a, a, a people's career in terms of how much time they spend either on email or like responding in spreadsheets and slides and stuff versus how much they did in code, like you just see it descending for leads. So the more you can get kind of real time experience building fun, cool projects you'd be interested in. And for me, this was actually using a CSS grid was the one thing I wanted to uh, uh, play with. Was there any particular reason why you wanted to play with that or it was? You yeah, so um, uh, if you've ever tried to do web layout, it really just kind of sucks for, <laughs> for a while. Yes. So CSS Grid has always had something like I've had on my backlog of trying to play with. And then I was like, oh, we should totally build a, a, a fake uh, a meeting website. So I was like, okay, yeah, we, we can bang this out. So uh, key here also is Dan Delamarski was one of the biggest contributors to this. Um, he helped do the, kind of the export meeting image and a bunch of other stuff and, and obviously got this across the finish line. Cause that's the other thing once, uh, you know, you kind of run out of time and all projects are like done at 90% and then it's like, crap, I have to update, you know, the, uh, uh, the CDN, I have to update this, you know, the Netlify branches, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all built on Netlify, it does uh, CI auto branching. Uh, Netlify is also a great tool because it does do branching. Um, each branch can actually get their own environment. So going back to, hey, how do we make developers productive? I think they have kind of a great example. Well, I uh, already used this to uh, show off uh, my meeting with Barack Obama and I pinned it to my Twitter <laughs> account, so. Thank you for thank you for your service. Yes, yes, you're welcome. Yeah, anytime. Dan, thanks so much for being here. It was a very fun conversation. My pleasure. And I am actually here. This isn't just you know some GPT three bot that uh, you actually wrote and added to meeting shot. So I am here. But, I swear. But isn't that what the bot would say? Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> exactly what the bot would say. All right. Thanks a lot, and everybody out there. This is Kit Merker from Noble Nine signing off.